Okay, let's do it. So, welcome everyone. Uh, fun fact, um, the slides you're about to see are largely the same as we use in our internal onboarding and for our internal um, training on, on how to interact with communities. Uh, that's no mistake. Uh, we do believe in transparency and we do believe in sharing knowledge. So this is quite deliberately us externalizing things which we do, how we do them, and not only talking some random things and, and making nice noise about uh, nice noise not nice noise about stuff. It's very much us externalizing what we do and live internally. So just out of interest, because I always do this when I'm in in a little bit adjacent communities. Uh, who knows what Grafana is? Okay, that's maybe 30%, which is great because I always like having audiences where people don't really know it. So I, I probably don't have to ask you if you know what Grafana Labs is, but do you know what Prometheus is? Anyone? Okay. Kubernetes? Okay, no surprise. Um, if you're using Kubernetes and you're not using Prometheus, you might want to reconsider. <laughs> I mean, they're literally, literally made for it. Literally made for each other, and uh, the two founding projects of CNCF. Anyway, um, so I'm going to start with a few uh, theoretical bits, and then we go into the application part. So, what is a community? A community is usually a group of people who have a certain commonality. This commonality might be. Uh, in various shapes or forms, if you are into into fishing or skateboarding or whatever, like you have some reason why why you feel the need to to meet with other people of that certain group. Like for example, open source. Um, there are a few uh, also in the in the source files. You can also click the things uh, we are going to. You can download them. So if you want to read more on any of this, uh, there's also source links. So um, there's a few, uh, when you come to, from German, and I am German, uh, there, is, uh, there is a few a few nice translations, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft is this community, and you are based largely um, on roles and values and shared interactions, and a lot of this is intrinsically motivated. Like, people can't force you to go to this one bicycling club. Um, you come there, and you go there, and you keep coming there because you want to do this out of your own desire. Contrary to a society where a lot of interactions are not very direct, uh, a lot of things like you send a letter or something is very indirect, you have a lot of impersonal roles and a lot of formalized values, and a lot is driven by external or extrinsic motivation. For example, you don't want to be fined, I mean, that's a good example while, while here in Singapore, um, or you don't want other people to, to look down on you or something, so a lot of this is extrinsically motivated, not intrinsic. There's another translation of Gesellschaft, uh, of where people come together, and that's cooperation. And this is very much based on formalized roles, and it always has an inherent structure. The others also have inherent structures, but not as, as raw, as easily seen as corporations. And part of why you are at, at a company, and if you're here for, for work, uh, is literally called compensation. So you are being paid for using your time for not being, I don't know, at the beach with your family or, so, or whatever um, to, to do the thing you're doing at work. So this is very, very much an extrinsic motivation. And yes, any healthy company has a healthy internal culture. So what is community not? And again, this is what, what all the people joining Refine Labs see, including marketing and including sales. We take this seriously. Um, communities are not a sales channel, they are not a marketing target group. They do tend to reject outside commercial interest quite strongly, as most people in this room will probably attest to. And communication with and within communities often has its own rules. It's, it's not that you can just like go from one to the other and everything is the same. Over time they develop certain patterns of communication, certain memes, certain in-jokes, certain ways of how to interact with each other, and it's it's important to, to take this into account and honor this kind of thing. Because it's really, really easy to get this kind of thing wrong. So, why do we care? And again, this is from the perspective of internal. A large, large, arguably the largest part of the success of Grafana Labs, and oh, maybe I should explain this, because if you don't know what Grafana and Grafana Labs is, Grafana is a visualization tool which visualizes data um, for basically all 
all databases you can think of. Um, and people use this primarily for operations of IT, of cloud, uh, of cloud native microservices, whatever. Um, but also um, you can use this at industry. I literally know someone who, who runs a port and they have a, way, a waiting thing in the conveyor belt and when they take on coal, they can see how heavy the coal is. From this, they deduce how much uh, how much moisture is in the coal, and they can stop the conveyor belt uh, when when it's too moist. Of course, it would spoil the rest of the batch. So that's all of the things that you can do with this. And uh, Grafana Labs is the company which provides this open source, but also sells services based on this. So, and. This, again, is something we, we teach the people internally and also which is coming directly from the founders. Uh, that Grafana Labs honestly tries to teach the community well. And the communities, as you can see, are also repaying with engagement, are also repaying with like attending conferences or speaking positively about a thing. So there is also some, quite some, uh, some egoistic motives in, in this from the company perspective. But the good thing is we found a way to align those, uh, those incentives so we don't do open core or anything. It's true actual open source. So the thing is that as a company which actually is built on open source, we actually do believe that this is a strategic requirement for the continued growth of the company. And if done right, and this is also part of being honest for anyone who invests in, in community, like I'm director of community, Grafana Labs pays me to do this. Yes, there is something we get back, and that is uh, that this is an integral part of the sales motion if done right. Another really nice uh, survey, uh, they did one again, I think, last year, but the, the results are basically the same. Um, Stack Overflow asks how developers choose software. And if you look at the first three, starting free, tri uh, free trial, asking other developers and visiting developer communities, those are things which are done really well within open source. Open source enables all of the three of those. Of course, you can just use it yourself. You can try it. You can talk to others who are using it. Uh, you can find people at conferences who are excited about this. So leveraging this, this um, this dynamic where software, yes, software is eating the world and as such developers are eating the corporations or, or defining the corporations and more and more power is given to uh, developers. You can actually shape as a company what people, way before they ever have a potential commercial uh, conversation with you, use or do not use by honestly making the open source absolutely stellar and supporting the open source user as if they were paying users. Um, there's also a personal example in this. Uh, I've been in open source for 25 years by now, which <laughs> is a long time. <laughs> um, and there was something within Prometheus. Again, Prometheus is a monitoring tool. Uh, it's a database for metrics, and it is tightly coupled to Kubernetes. So uh, the type of monitoring on, or observability data which Kubernetes emits is precisely in the format which, uh, which Prometheus ingests ingests precisely course Prometheus exists. So they are super, super tightly coupled. Anyone who's using Kubernetes in any way or form is using some way of, of Prometheus or Prometheus compatible software. Um, and in yeah, late 2015, early 2016, it was me as a member of the Prometheus team, not working at Grafana or anything, recommending within Prometheus, hey, can we deprecate our own visualization solution because Grafana is so much better is this something we would be willing to do and yes we were willing to do and this has had an outsized impact on the trajectory and on the growth of Grafana Labs the company that was years and years before I ever me personally ever even thought about joining Grafana Labs or I, I didn't think I would ever do this and still from a purely uh, community perspective I uh, yeah, I just trusted the people who did this so what makes a healthy community? Well, again, every community forms around a common cause, for example, ethics and, and such in open source, where we believe in, in carrying stuff forward. And they tend to coexist and work together. And they, the causes tend to remain long-term. So if you have someone who is KDE and you have someone who is Genome or VI and Emacs or whatever, or Gen2 and Debian, um, yes, they might, they might interact and they might even, you might have people who are part of more than one community, but those communities tend to, to really uh, carry whatever their cause is forward long term. They tend to not merge. Like even with WeI and NeoVim, you see that there's different groups who the one you really use WeI or VIM 
and the others really use uh, NeoVim, and there is not huge overlap. Like some people migrate, but the actual communities, the mailing lists, and everything, are relatively relatively static. And you have to just accept this, and to uh, both as a company or as a community manager or as as someone who works with the communities, honor this kind of thing and not just enter something and just try and shove everyone to a different direction. So, on uh, on respect and on trust, humans are herd animals. We are optimized for uh, social interaction. Being an introvert myself, we are, some of us are, are optimized for social interaction to, to varying degrees, but uh, as a species, one of the reasons why we have survived and thrived is, of course, we have social interaction, and as such, we can do more than the individual can do. And this means that a lot of those, uh, a lot of the things which you do while interacting with other humans or with any other system made of humans, uh, a lot of this is built into deep into your psyche, coming from your DNA, coming from thousands and thousands and thousands of years of uh, of basically people dying or not dying because they starved, because they didn't work or work together with their group. So a lot of this is automatic in the background. So if you don't feel respected in a certain group, you will not want to interact. And if you can't trust that you are safe within your environment, you will either just leave or you have significant overhead in your interactions with this community because you just don't feel safe. Um, which means you might retract from that community or just uh, like not be as open because you are always thinking about protecting yourself and not about actually engaging within the community. On the flip side, if you are accepted as you are and if uh, if everything is, is, is positive, then yes, social interactions will actually feel positive and energize you. If you're not, they will feel draining. So, yes, we, we need to safeguard communities. That's why we have code of conduct. That's why we have diversity drives. That's why FOSS Asia and FOSTEM and others are, are working so much on, on those kind of things. And there's a few caveats. We are really, as a species, hardwired for fight or flight. And it is fully automatic in the background. You can influence this to some extent, but you cannot fully do it away. So automatically, when you're exposed to negatives, all of this starts running in your, in your head. So if you don't feel secure, you will act more insecurely, you will act more defensively, you will also act more aggressively, and others also fall into this pattern. So if you, if you come to this inflection point of a vicious cycle where things just devolve, um, it's really, really easy to basically lose whole communities and just have them go down the drain because um, cause a few people were, were initially uh, maybe not very nice, which is with my, for example, my Fostem hat on or many, many moons ago with my Freenode hat on or so, um, we were extremely quick and vigilant about, about stopping things early because once they devolve to a certain point, it's almost impossible to, to get things back. How do I do time? Okay, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, and also iron law of institutions. Uh, anything, um, anyone who's, who's in a position of power within any organization is much more likely to, uh, to defend their position and see this organization wither and die than to just give up whatever position of power they have and, and be like, okay, it's someone else's time. By extension, communities tend to, to fade away over time. Uh, I, I mentioned a few Linux distributions, some of them maybe. Um, but they are very, very unlikely to actually change. So it's much more often the case that communities simply go away and fade than that they really change trajectory or change what they're about. And speaking from a company level, this is really important to, to take into account because if you have, I don't know, a, a big migration or something, Doing this in a consistent and, and respectful manner, which actually pulls people with you, is exceedingly important to your, uh, to your success. So yeah, safeguarding. As we are social animals, we are really good at detecting situations which just don't feel right. And all of us will have had those situations where we just don't feel safe, just don't feel it's weird. Children are really good at externalizing this. Uh, then we are taught to, to not externalize as much because that leads to less fighting, but it also leads to be people being less honest. But the thing is, community 
communities really depend on open and honest and transparent uh, communication. Like, for example, literally putting internal slides out into the open as something of, hey, this is how we think about it. And you can really only safeguard communities from within. Like, it's, it's literally impossible to, to just swoop from the outside and be like, okay, I'm going to fix whatever. No, you won't. Uh, unless you have respected members within the community, you have good standing and some position of, of power or influence or whatever, you can't put them in a code of conduct uh, enforcement or, or safeguarding situation because they will just be rejected. Like, if it's really bad, yes, get police and everything, but then we're not in community, then we are in society. Or get your boss's boss, then we are in, in cooperation. But within community, you can only do it from within. For anyone who interacts within communities, and this will be hopefully 100% of the attendees here, um, I highly recommend uh, creating culture canaries for yourself. There you find certain things about a culture or about social interactions which you like, which you do not like, and you deliberately think about them and you deliberately write them down and every X amount of time, six months, two years, whatever, you actually go through them and check yourself, am I still honest with myself? Is this still the same community? Did certain things go in a direction I don't want to? Can I change it? Should I pull back? Can I ignore it? Because my, my own uh, outlook on things changed. But having this and doing this on a somewhat regular basis is really, really, really powerful. And the best examples are usually the ones where things go wrong. Like someone does something bad, says something bad, whatever. How is enforcement being handled? Is this a super painful process for everyone or is it as okay as it can be made? And in the end, there's a public and transparent summary and, and everyone moves on and is able to move on, except for people who might be kicked out or whatever. Um, things like these tell you much more about how people, how uh, communities actually behave and interact than just random nice words on a, on a, um, on a mission statement. The summaries, um, basically to avoid changing your own definition of what you accept within a community interaction, write it down, keep, uh, keep yourself honest about it, and never ever talk about it. If I tell you what my culture canaries are about, for example, interactions within giving talks, they become more or less useless. Of course, people can start optimizing for them uh, if they want to push me in a certain direction or whatever. So yes, you can make suggestions to others if they don't come up with their own, but don't just tell them your own. Because as Goodhart said, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So formalizing all of this, most communities have at least informal roles. Um, this person who, who always shows up and does a certain thing over years and years. We have this at FOSTEM. I'm certain we have this at FOS Asia, where people don't even like have real formalized roles. They just show up and they do the thing and then they go away and they just keep doing it. Uh, there's also obviously formalized roles. In particular, as you grow, as you, for example, need a legal entity, and once you need to start handling money and such, you need to have some structure and you need to have people within that structure who have formalized role because that's how you interact outside of the communities. Uh, but they always have informal ones. Visible and transparent structures. So how can I actually interact with this? Like if I have a complaint or if I want to help with, I don't know, shepherding speakers or whatever, how can I interact with this? How can I get started? Which by extension means writing good documentation about, your, uh, about the communities you care about, about the communities you run, to enable people to actually um, come and start helping us out if they so choose. Um, some structures are a signal as much as a tool. Prime example is code of conduct, because the best code of conduct is well written and everything, yes, but the best code of conduct would be, in theory, the one which would never ever need to be enforced, because everyone already acts in a positive way. And that's not a function of the code of conduct being written well, that would be a function of, of that community being perfect. Uh, to some extent. So this is both. It is a signal that yes, by having a code of conduct, you signal that yes, you do take things seriously and that you actually formalize and write down and expose and externalize how you think about things, how you will treat things if certain things happen, what you find acceptable, what you don't find acceptable, what you list, what you don't list in those lists. But also, 
as the tool for actual enforcement and obviously then as the as the run through and as the person who who always gets pulled in when we have anything code of conduct within grafana labs which is thankfully very 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 uh, little um, the point about enforcement is quick early transparent if you just pull it in, oh, we're going to form a committee and we're going to talk about 10 years for like that thing and maybe you'll get a reply and maybe you won't get a reply. That doesn't build trust. It's not, it's not a soap opera, so you don't have to do all the details in, in public. You absolutely shouldn't, but at least at the end you should post a summary or a once yearly report or whatever where you just say, okay, this is, um, this is what, we, uh, what we did in the end. So there's also limits. Communities exist within the context, within the society. If uh, here, I don't know, the fire protection brigade comes and tells us uh, we are not allowed to have this, of course, random example, I don't know. Uh, we can't just continue having this talk. We have to actually uh, follow whatever the, the rules of the society are we, we are within. Um, you, your fishing community can't overthrow the government, I hope. Um, and also, um, if, if someone uh, who's external to the community or in the community uh, decides to just unilaterally change a thing which, uh, which the leadership of the community or of that project decided differently, it won't work. So there are still limits to this. So yes, they have limits in the impact and it's really important to be aware of them. App applying all of this. So most and again, this is the internal slides on purpose, no changes. So the hour here is Grafana Labs. Um, at least for how Grafana Labs chose to interact with, with open source is that the products are actually based on open source projects. And the vast majority of what you have in open source is what makes up the product. It's maybe 98% per of the code base. We have a very thin veneer of, of uh, differentiation on top of the projects on purpose because we want to have healthy long-term projects and healthy long-term communities. And the thing is, the, the communities themselves usually don't really care about, about the products. They mainly care about the projects, and that's fine, and that's something where, as a company, you have to be really, really careful to, to not overstep the boundaries. Again, Open Core is a good example, where you basically put all the really important bits and the really useful bits behind a pay gate and people stop using your product as much and your project as much. We've seen this with several competitors to Prometheus, to Mimir and others, which, which tried this and, and failed. And that's part of why Grafana grew so much. Um, it's important to have an open governance. Uh, speaking with my Grafana Labs on, head on, we have a lot of projects which are under the umbrella, under the legal umbrella of Grafana Labs, but the governance is not completely tied to Grafana Labs. So you can join the project, you can have votes about stuff without uh, Grafana Labs deciding every, every single thing. Um, in my specific case, all of the governances within the uh, Grafana Labs projects are, are based on the Prometheus governance, of course I'm part of Prometheus and I liked it. Um, all the communication happens on GitHub, on mailing lists, like obviously you have some work stuff and such internally on Slack or whatever but the vast majority is on issues in, in tickets and things like these. It's important to have the membership truly open to everyone, even competitors. We have people working like with formalized roles as full maintainers with full voting rights on Grafana Labs projects who are not employed by Grafana Labs and never plan to be. And no matter if you sponsor as a company someone else being a um, a, uh, a member of some project or if it's people who, who join your projects, membership is always personal. It's not the case that, oh, they pay X amount of money or we have this and that partnership and now uh, we make this and that person this and that role. No, it's a person who does the work. It, they might be sponsored by their company or they might not, whatever. But the point is them as a person are the one who actually are part of the project and also are, um, if they move companies, they still retain the membership, they're not kicked out. There are other projects who do it differently and I strongly, strongly disagree and I strongly implore you to never ever do this because it kills the community over, over uh, a relatively short amount of time. So what does it mean to be project first? Every project which you nurture should have a community lead. 
that doesn't need to be a full-time role. Ideally, it's not a full-time role. Ideally, it's someone who's driving the tech or the people or whatever within the project forward anyway. And it's important to identify the people who like doing this work as opposed to um, just assigning someone and then uh, they, don't, they don't find a lot of fun and, and, and positive sentiment in this and that they basically don't do it. Um, there are a few mechanisms which we like to apply, for example, community calls. For us, this means a monthly call always the same day of the week, always the same time. Yes, time zones and, and yes, UTC, um, sorry, uh, still jet lagged, um, summer, winter time, things like these, but still like keep the same time slot. Uh, make sure everyone can join. Don't gate on like subscription or you need to register or anything. Just let people join. Make certain that everyone can actually bring topics. So it's not just you talking to people. It's an actual exchange of ideas, actually talking with each other. Make certain that everyone can, can edit those notes. It's not a case of you writing and defining what the reality of that meeting was. No, everyone should be able to, to put stuff onto the agenda or to help write your notes and make the, make the recordings public. Um, other things which we like to apply is uh, we have a meetup series called Grafana and Friends, which is in various uh, cities around the world. Um, it's always in cities where we have one, two, three dedicated people who actually are con committed to running this thing long term, and then we help them with like finding venues um, or getting getting pizza money or getting speakers, maybe paying for a speaker to travel to to a place to uh, to speak at the meetup. Things like these keep local communities healthy, and that's why we as Grafan Labs do this to keep our communities healthy. Healthy public speaking, um, yes, like. Grafana Labs is paying for me to stay uh, to to be here, and not to talk about this and that product which you must buy. I'm literally just I'm literally giving you the internal presentation from the onboarding. Grafana Labs does this because we do believe in open and transparent communication, and just by externalizing what we do, that we find other like-minded people who either like this thing and want to use the stuff, or maybe want to work for us, or maybe want to support it and buy from us. Like all of those are fine, and all of those are intended, obviously. Um, but we are not, we are not forcing anyone. We we are actually like paying for people to speak about completely irrelevant stuff. At conferences, big and small, uh, blog posts at Grafana Labs are written mainly by engineers. Um, well, not mainly anymore, but at least for the tech topics, they are written by by the engineers. Uh, we have a lot of non-tech topics these days, or non-Grafana tech topics. Um, which is sometimes hard because upper management is like, okay, this, there's an engineer. That engineer is uh, really expensive. Uh, why should they be spending half a day or so to write a blog post? I can have them implement a feature in this time. So this is an actual investment into, into making certain that, yes, the people who build the thing are also having a public voice and speak to the wider community and show that, yes, there are humans where they had issues, how they, how they went through. And obviously a ton of webinars where you just explain your stuff and do this again and again and again and again. Because one of the truisms of, of the fundamentals of tech, like for example this talk is, the actual content doesn't change, the audience changes. Like your math teacher at school, they will probably start their career and end their career teaching the same math. And that's fine. It's not that the content really changes, it's that the audience changes. So yes, webinars and just repeating what, what you've been saying forever is, is also good. As I said, engineers are expensive, uh, travel is expensive, and if you only send marketing people or if you only send field engineers, uh, at some point you will lose authenticity within the wider communities. You have to actually send the people who do those things. So one of the reasons why Grafana projects are so successful and one of the reasons why Grafana as a company is so successful is because we actively invest engineer time, engineering time into public speaking, writing blog posts, interacting with the community, and basically just going do, doing good stuff. And people take notice and they appreciate it. Yep. Final words of warning. Again, this is internal, and every every sales and marketing person being onboarded uh, sees those those things. Keep uh, marketing and sales mechanisms away from uh, from community mechanisms. You will mess up interacting with your community. You will also mess up in other ways and forms in life, in your work, in wherever, because that's part of being human. When you mess up, be honest about it. Be transparent about it. Learn from it. Document it, whatever it was. 
and move on. And everyone else does the same. And again, this builds towards this psychological safety. We are social animals. You don't want to get put someone into this fight or flight or just uh, think, that you, uh, think that you lie to them. Because if you're dishonest or treat uh, communities just like a random sales or marketing initiative, they will absolutely turn away. That community will die and your project will also wither. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. Uh, I was just curious, uh, where can we see which cities have uh, Grafana and Friends meetups? Uh, meetup.com. Okay. Just go to meetup.com and search for Grafana and Friends. Um, with um, the code of conduct, um, some conferences do uh, transparency reports. Um, they anonymize it, but everyone knows um, it can lead to like, defamation cases. Um, what's your thought on transparency reports for code of conduct? I think they're good. I also disagree that everyone knows what uh, what they're about. Like depending on the size of the community, uh, if you if you have a group of fifty people, yes, everyone will know everything, uh, and of course. But like for example, just yesterday or today, uh, Linux Foundation put out uh, put out a report, uh, a transparency report on code of conduct enforcement, and I knew about one single of the cases, out of maybe half a dozen or so, or maybe a dozen. Um, I, I strongly believe we need to have them. Because the thing is, again, um, any investigation into a code of conduct issue is not a public soap opera. Part of protecting the victim or potential victim or at that time alleged victim. Um, and everyone else is to, to not make everything public and to actually take everything private, have actual deep con conversations, talk to the people, have interviews, blah, 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 blah. So by definition, you pull everything very, very private. The one way to, to, to validate this kind of thing is only by being transparent after to the extent that you can, that you actually... Um, prove that you did something. So you can talk about, okay, as a result of this complaint, one person was told to uh, to not interact with this community anymore, or they will not be invited to the events anymore, or they need to have a cool down period of X amount of time. Uh, Linux Foundation also had someone apparently uh, go to go to counseling and, and provide proof that they did go to counseling, like whatever. But you have a paper trail of, yes, we did engage with this, and yes, this is the rough thing which happened, and this is the rough outcome. So people who, who are thinking of, should I be considering to join this community, actually see proof positive that this is what you're doing. Anyone else? Anyone else? More questions? If that's a question, I feel honored. <laughs> Richard, um, I'm just curious, your title is Director of Community. What do you do exactly? Do you write any code? I don't write any code. So what do you do? Your daily <laughs> your a work? a very good question. <laughs> the answer changes more or less daily, and I'm not joking. Um, so at a very basic level, I care about the continued strategic success of the, uh, of the projects we care about, which is primarily um, all the projects which we have ourselves. Plus, in particular, uh, Prometheus and Open Telemetry, because they're highly relevant to uh, to us as a company. Um, which means, for example, organizing the Dev Summits for uh, for Prometheus until last year running PromCon. This is the first year I'm not running it. Yes, uh, <laughs> things like these: uh, writing the governance, making certain that the uh, code of conduct is applied everywhere. All of this, but way, way more. Um, like giving public talks, helping internal people give public talks, publish their uh, CFP submittals, uh, a lot of license work. Um, it's endless. All right, uh, one more question. Anyone? I, I, I have one, uh, I mean, a bit going on with the, um, maybe with the people, like the structures of communities, like the, the governance and, and how they work. Do you see uh, like different communities have different uh, governance uh, methods. Uh, do you see uh, certain methods being more effective than others and, and would you advocate for some of them? That's a very, very, very deep question. So I know of, I know of at least one legal 
umbrella, which had to actually break their own bylaws because they were in such a stalemate because people didn't vote anymore. Like they had too many members who became inactive and with a little bit of wink wink, not nudge nudge and a lot of closed eyes, they basically did one move to, to get back into an operating state again. As a member of that thing, I, I fully agree of like, yes, this was the right move. Um, so one of the one of the things is be careful that you stay operational with your uh, with your uh, community with your uh, governance, which means you need to prune people who become inactive every X amount of time, either by asking them nicely or by kicking them out, or maybe they realize it themselves. But most people don't leave; they just stick around and stay. Um, so that's one of the things. The other thing is um, try and prevent hostile takeover. Because there are so many examples where uh, a company is paying directly or indirectly and and then just have enough people in positions of power and then they flip the switch and they own the thing. Um, that's also not great. As a general rule, I would say if you are still small, uh, full democracy is good. Uh, don't require a vote for everything. Put in uh, consensus mechanisms where, like for example, similar to ITF, you have a rough consensus, and once rough consensus is achieved, you just move on. You don't have to wait for every last person to voice their opinion. You just move on, and everyone can can progress and keep keep pushing the project forward. For important things like changing governance, adding people, have uh, have votes, have formalized votes with a very rigid structure, and time boundaries of you can only run it for X amount of time. For example, two weeks. Um, have different limits of, of acceptance rate, like it's it's a different thing to add a person to a project than to kick one out or to change the governance, like have different levels for this. And once you are above a certain uh, above a certain size, it usually is most efficient just of how human and, and communication works, because n squared growth rate, blah, 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 um, to have a, a inner core of sort of, of trusted people like governance committee or, or steering committee or something. Usually it should be an uneven number. Um, three, five, seven is good. 